Good evening, everyone. Uh, today's topic is early and late post-operative complications of cataract surgery. The moderator for today's class is Dr. RPS Sir. We'll be covering this topic in a few subheadings: wound-related complications, corneal complications, anterior chamber inflammation, IOP changes, IOL-related complications, and posterior chamber complications. Early post-op complications include wound leak. Iris prolapse, wound thermal burn, corneal complications like corneal edema, striate keratopathy. In the anterior chamber, we have toxic anterior segment syndrome, acute endophthalmitis, and postoperative uveitis. We can have early hypotony or raised IOP. We can have decentration or dislocation of the IOL, pupillary capture, or a capsular block syndrome. In late postoperative complications, we have wound dehiscence, astigmatism, Brown McLean syndrome, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, chronic endophthalmitis, chronic uveitis, UGH. Uh, we can have late hypotony or glaucoma. IL related complications include malposition, anterior capsular phimosis or fibrosis, posterior capsular opacification, and posterior segment complications include CME, retinal light toxicity retinal detachment and exacerbation of e coming to wound related complications early wound related complications include wound leak and wound thermal burn late wound related complications are included under an umbrella term called as wound dehiscence they include wound leak over filtering blep wound rupture epithelial downgrowth fibrous syngrowth and against the wound astigmatism We'll be discussing all of them in brief. Won't just one, just one minute, Pranav. One minute. Uh, yeah. Rajesh, can you mute yourself? I think there's a lot of disturbance. Yeah, go ahead, Pranav. Wound leak in the early post-operative period. It's usually seen in the first few days of the surgery. The etiology can be uh, three-pronged. Either there's a proper wound, but we have low IOP. We know that the internal corneal valve is dependent on IOP to be watertight. Hence, if the IOP is low due to insufficient chamber inflation, insufflation at the end of the surgery or sluggish ciliary body function or rubbing of the eyes, then even a properly constructed wound may leak. We can have problems with wound construction like excess cautery, which leads to a devitalized flap, tissue necrosis and delayed tissue ingrowth, tearing or buttonholing during tunnel making, and false passages in the tunnel with multiple levels of AC entry can also lead to early post-op wound leak. Incorrect suture placement or tying, which usually distorts the wound architecture, can also be a cause of wound leak. The clinical features typically include poor vision, ocular hypotony, the patient can have broad corneal folds, a shallow AC, hyphema, choroidal effusion, choroidal folds, macular edema or optic nerve head edema, the diagnosis is typically made on the basis of a Seidel's test. We can adjunct this diagnosis with the help of a UBM or ASOCT. In this image, we can see a small wound leak over here. The management of wound leak usually depends upon the etiology, timing, severity, structural appearance of the incision. If the wound leak is noticed in the first couple of days, it can usually self-seal due to the post-operative inflammatory process. If wound leak is noticed after a few days of the surgery, then medical treatment is given only if wound apposition is good and ocular integrity is normal. The medical treatment includes decreasing of topical steroids, giving prophylactic antibiotics, cyclopagics, and aqueous suppressants. Uh, usually, if the aqueous keeps on flowing through the wound, aqueous contains plasminogen and its activators, and hence it has a fibrinolytic activity, it usually retards wound healing, so we have to give aqueous suppressants in such cases. If wound leak is persistent for more than 5 days, or it is severe, that is IOP is less than 2 mm Hg, then we have to resort to full-time patching or soft contact lens. Suturing is to be done in cases where the AC is flat or AC is shallow with a low IOP. Suturing is also done in cases where we have iris prolapse macular edema or choroidal effusion due to the hypotony or when there is external wound leak. Coming to wound thermal burn, insufficient flow of the coaxial irrigation fluid or the occlusion of outflow at the phaco tip or the aspiration line by either lens material 
or ovds causes insufficient cooling of the phaco tip and it causes heating of the phaco tip and due to this heat the heat from the tip is transferred from the tip to the corneal collagen which contracts at 60 degrees celsius this contracture causes distortion of the incision leading to wound gape and wound leakage it usually needs sutures or it, it might need it might need patch graft as well coming to wound dehiscence wound once again pranav even in eccs and sics you guys can produce a wound burst because of excessive cautery so when you apply your cautery see that you are further away from the limbus and not too close to the corneal end because you sometimes the cautery is excess when you especially when you start second when uh, regarding wound gape you you had mentioned ubm as one of the diagnostic uh, methods remember that they are always for late post ops ubm should not be done in an early post op because the wound gap is a open blow asoct can be done but not ubm okay third is sometimes if you have too much of hypotony your cedals can be negative because the intraocular pressure is so low also if the conjunctiva has got well opposed to your uh, limbus then the fluid may be flowing subconjunctively and creating a pseudo bleb then also you can have a cedals negative but at the same time you will see a bleb right over your surgical wound so just because it is cedals negative it does not rule out the wound gate even a very soft eye you will not have enough aqueous coming out through that okay you will have a ciliary shutdown component by the time you see the patient in your opd carry on yes ma'am wound dehiscence is usually due to direct ocular trauma spontaneous loosening or breaking of the sutures or tissue necrosis or melt the risk factors for early wound dehiscence include profound systemic illness malnutrition vitamin c deficiency pre existing collagen vascular disorders and perioperative systemic steroid exposure uh, this is the first part of wound dehiscence which is an inadvertent filtering bleb it usually occurs when there is a wound leak under sealed conjunctiva if it occurs within the first couple of days it can resolve spontaneously if it occurs after the first few po- post operative days it indicates that it was due to the breakdown of an initially well opposed wound spontaneous resolution in such cases is less likely because the tract can get epithelialized and therefore it needs surgical management the indications of surgical management when there is an inadvertent filtering bleb are poorly tolerated ocular hypotony discomfort due to the bleb cosmetic concerns delen formation weeping of the aqueous from large thin bleb and reduced visual acuity due to encroachment of the flap over cornea coming to wound rupture it is a traumatic opening of a previously sealed wound with extrusion of intraocular contents the risk depends upon the size and architecture of the wound in this image we can see that the wound has been sutured and the iris has prolapsed out of it the IOL is also in the anterior chamber. The rate of post-operative IRS prolapse is somewhere around two to three percent after ECCE. Ernst et al. has demonstrated the strength of various incisions. A limbal incision can withstand the pressure of 160 mmHg. Two steps scleral incision can withstand around 400 mmHg, and a three step scleral incision can withstand pressures of up to 2000 mmHg. Surgical management is usually done in cases of wound rupture. The iris can be either repositioned or excised. If the iris is healthy, it can be repositioned. But generally, if the iris is prolapsed for more than 24 hours, then it is excised and sent for culture. It cannot be repositioned to prevent the risk of endophthalmitis. Any other reason you don't reposition? Well, I mean, what if you leave the iris outside? What else will be the problem? If it's a small knuckle and it's well covered by conjunctiva, but we still take it up what are the other possibilities one is end off other than that please others contribute i don't know your names uh, i think we will have the discussion okay, okay fine 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 okay then i'll stop uh, coming to epithelial downgrowth it is the proliferation of epithelium over endothelium trabecular meshwork and iris it presents in a few months after surgery it can present as corneal decompensation it can present as severe glaucoma with or without angle closure it can also present as chronic anterior uveitis iris cysts it can present as a retrocorneal membrane with a well demarcated leading edge the diagnosis is done on basis of slit lamp examination on specular microscopy we can see a clear distinct distinction between 
endothelial cells and epithelial cells. Uh, to diagnose epithelial downgrowth, we can shoot the argon laser on the suspected areas where we think that the epithelium has grown over the iris. If there is epithelial downgrowth, then that area shows a white fluffy uh, consistency after the laser is shot at it. Whereas if there is no epithelial growing on the iris, it will produce a brown colored burn. The definitive diagnosis of epithelial downgrowth is made on the basis of histopathological examination. In this image, we can see the well demarcated leading edge of the epithelial downgrowth. Most common symptoms of epithelial downgrowth include decreased visual acuity, a red painful eye, tearing, photophobia and foreign body sensation. In this slit lamp photo, in this slit lamp photo, we can see a grey sheet with scalloped borders. It's extending across the corneal endothelium and it has overlying stromal edema. The management of epithelial downgrowth is removal of the tissues which we suspect to have epithelial downgrowth upon. It usually includes a parsplena vitrectomy, iridocyclectomy or cryotherapy of the involved cornea. In this slit lamp photo, we can see that there is a hyperreflective curvilinear incision. This is the tract which has been followed by the epithelium to grow down into the AC. In this OCT of the anterior segment, uh, we can see a hyperreflective sheet of presumed epithelial cells which extend through the previous clear corneal incision and these have spread across the endothelium. These are the few other manifestations of epithelial downgrowth like an inclusion cyst or a pearl tumor of the iris. Coming to fibrous ingrowth, it is more prevalent than epithelial downgrowth. In fibrous ingrowth, the connective tissue enters the anterior chamber from the incision. On slit lamp examination, we can see a thick opaque membrane on posterior surface of cornea with or without vascularization. Fibrous ingrowth is usually slower to grow. It is more well demarcated and more vascularized than the epithelial downgrowth. The risk factors which lead to fibrous ingrowth include trauma, prolonged inflammation, wound dehiscence, delayed closure of the wound, vitreous incarceration or desmet tears. The management of fibrous in ingrowth is retrocorneal membrane excision and penetrating keratoplasty. Against the wound astigmatism, this is the abnormal flattening of the axis in which the incision was made. In this we can see the K values here are around 42.9, 43, 40. But near the incision they have reduced to almost 39.5. The risk factors for against the wound astigmatism include long wounds and shorter tunnels. Superior incisions have a higher risk than temporal incisions and poor patient healing. The diagnosis is made on the basis of keratometry and refraction. Uh, if the inc Generally, if the incision is less than 5 mm, the abnormal flattening will be in the range of 1.5 diopters or more. If the incision is 6 to 7 mm, the flattening will be more than 2 diopters. And if we are making an ECCA incision, then the abnormal flattening will be more than three diopters. The management is surgical only if it is detected within the two, first two to four post-operative weeks. Usually the management is conservative with glasses and contact lenses. Further, we can opt for astigmatic keratotomy, peripheral, cor peripheral corneal relaxing incisions, PRK and LASIK later on. So that was all about wound related complications. Okay, for now I can continue. Coming to corneal complications, uh, we can have corneal edema. Corneal edema can be either stromal and or epithelial edema, can occur in the immediate post-operative period. The endothelial damage leads to loss of mechanical barrier and pump function, pump, pump function which keeps the cornea dehydrated. Uh, usually, if the on the next, uh, first post-operative day, if there is microcystic epithelial edema, but the stroma is compact, they, Corneal edema is said to be due to raised IOP. Generally, if corneal periphery is clear, corneal edema will resolve. Edema due to surgical trauma usually results in four to six weeks. If the edema persists for more than three months, it will usually not clear. Here are a few causes of corneal edema after cataract surgery, which include surgical trauma by instrument, by the lens, by lens fragments and prior intraocular surgery corneal pre-existing corneal endothelial diseases, chemical injury by the preservatives in intraocular solutions or residual toxic chemicals on instruments, IOL related 
causes include IOL endothelial touch, UGH syndrome, and a rigid ACIL. Endothelial contact due to a flat chamber either centrally or peripherally or vitreous touch. Desmet membrane detachment. Elevated IOP can also lead to corneal edema. Inflammation. Epithelial ingrowth and fibrous downgrowth can also lead to corneal edema. A few causes of prolonged post-op elevation of IOP include retained viscoelastics, hyphema, ciliary block glaucoma, retained lens matter, pigment release from the iris, and endophthalmitis. Striate keratopathy is defined as corneal edema with desmet folds after cataract surgery in an eye which was relatively healthy and had a clear cornea preoperatively in the absence of an obvious desmet membrane detachment. It is seen maximally on POD1. It clears off within few weeks. In this image, we can see the gross DM folds and corneal edema. Risk factors for striate keratopathy include compromised but a compensated endothelial pumps, high ultrasound energy used during FACO, toxic substances which enter into the AC, and a prolonged surgery. Clinical features of striate keratopathy include radiating desmet membrane folds near the incision and also centrally, reduction in the corneal clarity. It usually corresponds to the degree of insult. We need to rule out a desmet membrane detachments by slit lamp, say, slit lamp examination and ASOCC, ASOCT. Management of striate keratopathy includes topical steroids and NCAs with or without hypertonic saline eye drops or IM. Coming to desmet membrane yeah. detachment. The previous slide. Sorry, by the time I reach the end, no, I forget. Yeah. So, can you tell me what sort of toxic substances are you talking about entering the anterior chamber? Ma'am, uh, toxic substances like uh, the detergents which are used to wash the instruments if they are not cleaned properly. Okay. In FACO surgery or any surgery, ma'am. Okay, that's one. Uh, ma'am, then incorrect. Uh, pH or concentration of the irrigating solutions. Okay. And then, uh, then some drape fibers. Preservatives. Because generally are inert. They may end up causing a uh, UPHs if uh, it causes anything. Then also it will be later. Not uh, it won't cause SKS. Preservatives. Yes, the preservatives and even otherwise even adrenaline is supposed to arrest the pump. That's why many times you use intracameral adrenaline, the bisulfide in it causes that. And that's why suddenly the cornea turns hazy after you use intracameral. Remember that even tripan blue, everything causes endothelial loss. It's just that it's not significant enough for us to not use that. So keep any medication to the minimum. That's why you need to wash the eye properly because you have put povidone iodine in all the tropical medications. So they, if they enter the eye also, they are endothelial toxic as well as the preservative in any of the topical medications. Coming to desmet membrane detachment, uh, it's due to either the instrument or IOL which is introduced through the incision or when fluid or an OVD is inadvertently injected between the desmet membrane and the corneal stroma. There is stromal swelling and epithelial bullae which is localized to the area of detachment. Here we can see a desmet membrane detachment and overlying corneal edema. And here is another image of desmet membrane detachment. The management of desmet membrane detachment involves the size of the detachment. Small detachments may resolve spontaneously. They can be reattached with air or an expansile gas like SF6 or C3F8, which helps it tamponade in the anterior chamber. Larger detachments can be sutured back into the place under gas or an OVD. The dispense membrane detachment uh, should be identified uh, immediately so that it can be limited and uh, we can save whatever remaining dispense is there uh, or we can correct it uh, for the uh, proper recovery. So high index of suspicion is the only thing which makes you to identify the desmet membrane detachment. And you need to understand it can occur at, in any patient at any stage of surgery. So usually high risk people are elderly people who are 80 or above and people who have dense arcus, small cornea 
and certain people who are predisposed to dismiss membrane detachment. So this can occur more in ECC where it is dissected along the insertion uh, of the uh, dismiss. So it can detach spontaneously once you extend the section. So you should be aware and any abnormal blow like a capsular membrane, which you don't expect at that stage, make the suspicion of a dismiss detachment because it's very transparent. Only the reflecting light will indicate that there is a detachment. Otherwise, you will not know till you finish the surgery and see the patient next day. It will be fully edematous. So the uh, main idea of uh, displacement detachment is uh, like you need to suspect it can happen in anybody so uh, people who get the complication will start looking for it and will identify it early but uh, anybody who's elderly undergoing an ecc or a large section surgery can develop uh, displacement detachment and in vaco when you watch the visco towards the end of the surgery in very elderly patient, there can be a chance of SMS detachment occurring spontaneously. And any blunt instrument you use uh, will predispose the SMS detachment. And in case in the uh, injection of visco or saline through side port or main port uh, can uh, cause the detachment, especially when you start injecting visco through after you in, enter. If you are not in place, not in AC, you are injecting in stroma, there's a possibility of dismiss detach. Continue. Yeah, one second. Hitesh, how long does it take for air to absorb? If you put an air bubble. Uh, at, at three to four in my micro. Yeah, three to five days. So air generally works if it's a superior detachment also. What about C3FF? How long does it take to get absorbed from the AC? I don't know, man. No. Yeah, about two weeks. Two. Okay, carry on. Also, if you, as sir told, all the other causes, and one more cause is excess hydration of the wound at the end of the surgery also causes DM detachment, and especially in SICS at the ACM port or at the side port. So don't make it too white. So keep on hydrating. If there is wound leak, there is a leak. So keep on hydrating till it becomes so white and you want to make it hard, it's not going to happen. So if there is a leak, you have to suture. So watch out for uh, hydration of the wound. Yeah, interestingly, try to avoid putting air bubbles in the anterior chamber because it's not it's not sterile, right? You're just taking it from the ambient atmosphere in the OT and putting it into the eye. Suppose somebody who's standing next to you has coughed just a minute ago, you're introducing those germs in the eye. So unless it's absolutely necessary, try to avoid air. And always hold the cannula away from the, I mean, from where you like in ECC we have entered and in the SACS we have made the paracentesis. So either the visco cannula or an adenaline cannula. So don't keep it towards endothelium and inject. And away from, as soon as you enter through the wound, don't start injecting from the wound itself. Go little inside, see the cannula is well inside the entry chamber. You are not incarcinating the DM and then you start injecting your visco or adenaline or saline, whatever. So I think uh, uh, most of the times we have seen, uh, you know, PG is doing this mistake. As soon as you just enter the wound, you start injecting the fluid, and you don't notice whether the DM is, uh, you know, detaching. And uh, by the time you notice it, you no, know, it's like a large detachment, uh, difficult to retrieve at that time. Continuation with Doctor Ekv has told. Uh, ophthalmic surgery, not only surgery, even uh, ophthalmology, diagnosis uh, uh, and identification, everything depends on seeing uh, what we are, uh, and that's how we make the diagnosis and same way we do the surgery also. So unless we see, we should not do anything and whenever we do anything inside the eye, we should see the tip of the instrument and in whatever stage it is and not to do anything blindly. Once we start doing like that, then we'll end up with complication. So anything we do, we need to see and uh, we should see the tip of the instrument. So doing your incision, especially ECC, is towards the corneal side because you don't want iris prolapse. Remember that iris prolapse can be managed and it is any day better for the eye than a desmus membrane detachment because by shifting your surgical incision corneal, you are going to disinsert the entire length of the desmus membrane. So, any of your during your repeated instrumentation, the desmus has nothing to hold it back and it will detach. 
And why do you have to attach the decimals back? Suppose it's a small decimals at the periphery, still we put it back in place. It's nowhere in the visual axis. What is the role of the decimals member in uh, the words? I think it'll come at the end to but that topic. It gives stability to the uh, cornea member. Okay, it uh, maintains clarity by the endothelial pump action. Apart from it? Then it can progress to a complete attachment later on. Okay, that's rare, but it can occur. What other role does the decimals member in play? I think it comes to the topic towards the end. We'll wait. We'll wait and come Tensile back. strength. Brown McLean syndrome it usually occurs on an average six years after the surgery. It is an unknown etiology. It is one of the rarest and most benign postoperative corneal edema. On slit lamp examination, we can see peripheral corneal edema with a central clear cornea. As you can see in both these images, there is peripheral corneal edema, but the central cornea is clear. It is most commonly seen after ICC or ECC surgeries. Usually, if the patient is kept AFAK, the edema starts inferiorly and progresses circumferentially. The central 5 to 7, 7 mm zone is clear. It usually spares the superior cornea. Centrally, gutte can be seen with underlying brown pigment epithelium and brown pigment on the endothelium overlying areas of edema. Pseudophakic bullous keratopathy, the incidence after cataract surgery is around 1 to 2 percent. Pseudophakic bullous keratopathy can be due to various causes like preoperatively low endothelial count, intraoperative extensive instrumentation, high phaco power, chemical toxicity, or vitreous prolapse. Postoperative causes include extensive inflammation, glaucoma, or IOL subluxation. Risk factors for pseudophakic bullous keratopathy include old age, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, a placement of AC IOL prior intraocular surgery, shallow AC and glaucoma. In these images, we can see the corneal bullae forming over here. Here we have microcystic epithelial edema and also large bullae can be seen over here. The symptoms of pseudophakic bullous keratopathy include reduced visual acuity, pain, discomfort, photophobia and lacrimation. The signs include endothelial folds, epithelial microcysts, bullae and epithelial defects stromal haze and an increased corneal thickness and corneal neovascularization. The management of PBK includes topical steroids and topical NSAIDs, hypertonic saline eye drops and eye ointment, anti-glaucoma medications to reduce the IOP, bandage contact lens to provide symptomatic relief. Later on, we can try endothelial or penetrating keratoplasty, corneal collagen cross-linking, anterior stromal micropuncture, in cases where there, where there is nil visual potential, we can try a Gunderson conjunctival flap or an amniotic membrane graft. Those were the corneal complications after cataract surgery. So the PBK is uh, common in people who have uh, uh, lower endothelial count and on an average uh, there is a loss of 500 uh, cells per cubic uh, millimeter during any uneventful cataract surgery. So, uh, we need to account for that whenever we plan for the surgery. So, careful screening of the patient has to be done to rule out any gut data. And in elderly people, uh, where the endothelial count is less, and we need to take adequate precautions. And we should uh, uh, avoid any uh, rough handling and uh, proper tissue handling and uh, uh, use of uh, high molecular elastic substance to protect the endothelium and uh, uh, to direct the phaco energy only towards the lens, uh, not to dissipate and avoid a chat. Now, why you have written uh, ocular pain as a symptom? Sir, due to the, the corneal, like uh, it is very highly supplied with nerves, so due to the bursting of the bullet, there will be pain, sir. Mm, so the nerve gets exposed and uh, then that causes pain. You know, you, you know any uh, management uh, relating to that? Any patient, uh, if you see a chronic uh, PBK patient, anything can be done with the uh, uh, this. Uh, I mean, uh, bullet rupturing uh, on and off and causing ocular pain. Any management is related to that? A bandage contact lens. Anything else which was done earlier, but nowadays it's hardly practiced. Stromal punctures. And uh, in elderly people, while using the NSA, we need to take care so that uh, 
we uh, we any complication due to that dryness is and the electrolysis is avoided. So careful use of uh, uh, NSAIDs and whenever we use NSAIDs in them, uh, uh, try to add uh, the lubricant, especially in patients who have delin or any surface irregularities or pterygiums, we need to take care of that. You can continue. Coming to anterior chamber inflammation after cataract surgery, it is going to be discussed under four headings, toxic anterior segment syndrome, endophthalmitis, post-operative uveitis, and retained lens matter. Toxic anterior segment syndrome is acute sterile post-operative anterior segment inflammation following any anterior segment surgery. The localized form of toxic anterior segment syndrome is known as toxic endothelial cell destruction syndrome. The symptoms include blurred vision, typically in the absence of pain or minimal pain. The inflammation onset is within 12 to 48 hours of the surgery. Signs include corneal edema, which is typically from limbus to limbus, AC cells, flare and hypopion. We can see a fibrinous membrane in AC around the pupil. There can be permanent damage to the pupil in terms of irregular or a permanently dilated pupil with thinning of the stroma. Chabicular meshwork may be damaged. It can lead to secondary glaucoma. A few important known causes of toxic anterior segment syndrome include ophthalmic instrument contaminants like detergent residues, like soaps and enzymatic cleansers, bacterial lipopolysaccharides and endotoxin residues, denatured OVDs, incorrect osmolarity, incomplete composition, and incorrect pH of irrigating solutions and OVDs and any other ocular medications may also cause toxic anterior segment syndrome. Preservatives or additives is also a known reported cause of TAS. Intraocular lens polishing compounds, cleaning and sterilizing compounds may also be implicated in causing this disease. In this photo, we can see typical limbus to limbus edema with a dilated pupil and a faint fundal glow. In this photo, we can see limbus to limbus corneal edema and a hypopoyani. The outcome of TAS patients is dependent on toxic insult to the anterior segment. In mild cases, there can be rapid clearing with no prolonged inflammation and no permanent damage. In moderate cases, we can have a small residual corneal edema and raised IOP. In severe cases, we can have corneal edema and eventual formation of peripheral anterior synechia, trabecular meshwork damage and also iris damage. The management of toxic anterior segment syndrome includes topical prednisolone hourly with cycloplegics and topical antibiotics. In some cases, oral steroids might be indicated. We have to keep a close watch on the IOP as the trabecular meshwork may be damaged. As we can see in this photo, we have limbus to limbus corneal edema, an irregular pupil, a hypopoyan and a faint fundal glow. This is a table which outlines the differences between toxic anterior segment syndrome and endophthalmitis. TAS is usually onset within 12 to 24 hours, whereas endophthalmitis onset is usually two to seven days after the surgery. Toxic anterior segment syndrome usually has no pain, but can have mild to moderate pain. Whereas endophthalmitis patients usually have severe pain. The corneal edema in TAS is usually limbus to limbus and the IOP may increase suddenly due to trabecular meshwork damage. In endophthalmitis, the corneal edema may be restricted to a specific area of trauma and the IOP may not be elevated. In both the cases, there is anterior chamber, moderate to severe anterior chamber reaction with increased cells, fibrin, and hypopine might be noted in both of the cases. Vitritis, however, is rare in toxic anterior segment syndrome, whereas in endophthalmitis is always present. The pupil is fixed and dilated in TAS, whereas in endophthalmitis, it can be reactive. Lid swelling and discharge are often present in endophthalmitis. Visual acuity is reduced in both. Uh, on B scan, endophthalmitis can reveal presence of exudates, whereas in TAS, it is usually anechoic. Toxic anterior segment syndrome shows dramatic improvement on steroids whereas endophthalmitis may worsen if it is given in absence of antimicrobial cover. Coming to acute endophthalmitis, the incidence after cataract surgery... Right is now, one question. I yes. mean, uh, 
do you think any uh, i mean uh, the, the gloves which you use any relation to that related to your task or uh, this thing sir the powdered gloves if we don't uh, wash the yeah powder. that's why we keep telling you people always wash it properly and then wipe it off nicely okay have you seen any case of tar uh, no sir not yet sir okay have you seen any vitritis uh, yes sir how do you roll up technically sir if any vitreous cells are present in the like, okay so do you see an idio or slit lamp sir slit lamp So always see the patient dilated on slit lamp and focus on the anterior vitreous phase to look for the vitreous cells which you may miss on indirect ophthalmoscopy and you may write that there is media haze because of cornea and all but it may be that subtle signs of vitreous which you can miss if you don't see the anterior vitreous phase on slit lamp. Okay, then okay. those vitreous cells getting and all I'm not asking to you. You can do it on your own. Okay, sir. Similarly, there is no shortcut to indirect ophthalmoscopy. Don't do 78D when you are suspecting a TAS or endo, because sometimes you will find a few wisps of exudates only in the inferior vitreo. So you have to do a proper indirect ophthalmoscopy. Okay, it's not just a 78D after dilatation. Coming to acute endo ophthalmitis, the incidence is 0.04 to 0.22 percent after cataract surgery. Some conditions which predispose a patient to get acute end of thalmitis include diabetes, chronic alcoholism, a complicated surgery, having wound complications, uh, intraoperative posterior capsular rupture, and vitreous loss. Uh, it is also dependent upon the amount and duration duration of instrumentation, history of prior intraocular surgery. and inferior incisions have a higher risk of end of thalmitis than superior incision as seen in this table you can see that most of the patients which pre which present with end of thalmitis present to us within the first two weeks however still a significant amount of patients can present after 2 to 6 weeks so 22% of the patients can present after 2 weeks so even after 2 weeks we cannot let our guard down in cases of end of thalmitis the most common symptoms include blurred vision red eye pain and swollen lids most common signs include a hypopion red eye loss of red reflex or a no view of retinal vessels corneal infiltrates can be seen in around 5% of the patients here the signs are conjunctival injection chemosis the patient may or may not have an rapd here we can see a hypopion there is loss of red reflex we can see corneal ring ulcers especially if streptococci and clostridia are causing the end of thalmitis incidentally we can notice wound gape leak torn or loose sutures and vitreous incarceration usually there is no view of the retina therefore we need to do a usg b scan to rule out retinal detachment vitreous membranes choroidal thickening and any retained lens fragment in this b scan we can see membranes in the vitreous the differential diagnosis for such a picture can be either retained lens fragments posteriorly displaced nucleus a corneal ulcer vitreous incarceration and a reaction to the iol materials and chemicals and obviously as we discussed before toxic anterior segment syndrome in maximum cases of acute end of thalmitis they grow a single organism most commonly they grow gram positive organisms of that most common is a coagulate coagulase negative staphylococcus that is a staphylococcus epidermidis in 70% of the cases it has a good prognosis streptococcus is usually seen in 9% of the cases it has the worst prognosis a few conclusions which were drawn from the end of thalmitis vitrectomy study included that iv antibiotics no, you can skip this this is not uh, in the scope of our but you can skip this slide okay sir sir investigations for sir the entire slide Yeah, you can go to next slide. Treatment for end of thalmitis includes intravitreal vancomycin, ceftazidime, and dexamethasone, plus topical fortified vancomycin orally, fortified gentamicin orally, prednisolone acetate orally, and homotropin or any cyclophilic two times a day with oral moxifloxacin or gatifloxacin, four hundred mg orally. Coming to chronic post-operative end of thalmitis. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Continue. It is usually caused by a weakly virulent organism like Propionobacterium acnes, Staph epidermidis, and Candida. The main differential for this is chronic uveitis. Propionobacterium acnes is usually a common cell. It is found on the skin. Clinical features include white plaques on the lens capsule, as we can see in this image, low-grade chronic inflammation, granul granulomatous KPs, fibrin strands, intermittent hypopion. It usually responds well to steroids and flares up on stopping. In this image, we can see a patient with chronic endophthalmitis with KPs. Similarly, in this, we can see granulomatous KPs in the arch triangle. This is a white plaque which can be seen on the posterior capsule. These are all signs which we have to look out for in cases of chronic endophthalmitis. The treatment includes vitrectomy, posterior capsulectomy, and injection of antibiotics with or without IL removal. Coming to post-operative uveitis, the risk factors include diabetes, a prior ocular surgery, pseudo-exfoliation, pigment dispersion, long-term use of myotics. In complicated cases like the cases which have sphincterotomy, iridectomy, vitreous loss, and sulcus fixation of IOL, the rate of post-operative uveitis is high. In an uncomplicated cataract surgery, the usual post-operative inflammation will resolve in three to four weeks with topical steroids or NSAIDs. If this low-grade inflammation lasts for more than four weeks, then we suspect chronic endophthalmitis, retained lens matter, IOL malpositions, or sulcus, fi sulcus fixation of an IOL. The management of post-operative uveitis is directed towards the cause. Retained lens matter, the incidence of retained lens uh, matter. One month, one month. Yes. Uh, uh, finally, yes, uh, can uh, tell what is the difference between the TAS and uh, acute endophthalmitis? How do you identify? The uh, TAS uh, is uh, immediate uh, post-op uh, after certain uh, four to three days. Whereas, uh, uh, acute end of uh, usually takes two to, I mean, uh, five to seven days. Okay, yeah, uh, and except in uh, mm -hmm. gram negative or uh, staph or ES and few, uh, it may be immediate also. Yes, Otherwise, yes. Then? Um, So the pain will be uh, 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 none to mind in case of TAS, whereas uh, it can be uh, uh, moderate to severe in case of uh, endophthalmitis. There won't be pain in TAS. Yes. Okay. And pain is characteristic of endophthalmitis. It's usually there. It's not mandatory there will be pain, but pain is characteristic of endophthalmitis. TAS is without pain. Okay. Yes, sir. And yes. there is uh, limbal to limbal uh, corneal edema in case of TAS, whereas uh, it's a localized segmental edema in case of uh, endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis is invariably associated with hypopion. And it's yes, not sir. that uh, it's not there in TAS, but it's uncommon. More commonly uh, associated with Yeah, uh, commonly associated with endophthalmitis. And uh, vitreous, vitritis is present in endophthalmitis, and in TAS, vitreous is uh, clear. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, uh, there is post segment involvement is always there in case of endophthalmitis. That is uh, yeah. not a similar uh, treatment wise. Uh, uh, it responds well with uh, steroids, TAS responds well with steroids. Uh, whereas uh, uh, endophthalmitis uh, should, uh, steroids can be given uh, under the cover of antimicrobial and uh, antibiotics. Yeah, and mostly TAS will be mild or moderate reaction. Severe uh, TAS is not very common, but uh, endophthalmitis grade can vary. And uh, TAS has a very good prognosis, whereas endophthalmitis has a poor prognosis when compared to Depends that. on the severity of uh, organism and the time of intervention. Yes, sir. Okay, Pranam. The incidence of retained lens matter is around 1.5%. It's more after phaco emulsification than ECC. Clinical features of retained lens matter depend upon the size, the type, the duration of the retained lens matter and patient response. It usually presents as uveitis, can present as raised IOP, corneal edema, and vitreous opacities. 
nuclear material causes more inflammation as compared to cortical material we can see the bit of retained lens matter here in this photo and similarly here in this photo management of retained lens matter includes topical corticosteroids topical NSAIDs and AGMs surgical management that is irrigation aspiration through the original incision is indicated when there is a large or visually significant lens material when the inflammation and raised IOP are not responding to topical medicines, when there is corneal edema or it's associated with retinal detachment tears or associated with endophthalmitis, the incidence of retained intravitreal fragments after cataract surgery is maximally around 1.6%. It usually needs sparse plana vitrectomy within one to two weeks after the surgery. Prana, one minute. So whenever there is a localized corneal edema, some Many times you can see the lens matter, but most of the time you will not be. If it is a chronic one, so always do a gonioscopy to see if there is anything retained in the angle. So sometimes that lens is diagnosed. Okay. And don't forget to do an indirect ophthalmoscopy because this may be just one small segment of a bigger piece sitting in the vitreous cavity, especially towards the periphery. Usually the retained lens matter can be either cortex epinucleus or nuclear fragment and if the PC is intact and if uh, there is a nuclear fragment or epinucleus in the anterior chamber that needs removal otherwise it will go for corneal decompensation. Uh, uh, cortex if it is uh, present it can be observed or we can remove. The indication for removal of a cortex is uh, any uh, patient who is a diabetic or has uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy or maculopathy or pre-existing CME. So uh, if we don't remove, it can cause progression of uh, maculopathy and progression of CME and the post-op visual recovery uh, may not be satisfactory. And if uh, the PC is breached and uh, cortex is significant to interfere with the visibility or uh, floaters, uh, is causing disturbance to the patient that needs removal. And if the nuclear uh, bit is smaller and is not causing any vitritis and there is no secondary glaucoma that can be observed. But if it is causing vitritis or secondary glaucoma, which usually happen by fourth month or sixth month. Uh, so in such case that will need removal. Otherwise we can observe that. Okay, continue. Coming to IOP changes after cataract surgery, we can have hypotony. Early hypotony can be due to aqueous leakage at the incision site, ciliary detachment or choroidal detachment. Late hypotony after cataract surgery can be due to retinal detachment, cyclodialysis, formation of a filtering bleb or persistent uveitis. Raised IOP after cataract surgery can be either due to open angle or closed angle pathologies. In open angle pathologies, we have a primary open angle glaucoma. Blood when do you call uh, clinically hypotonic eye, Sir, when the IOP is less than 5 mm mg. Open angle glaucomas include primary open angle glaucoma, blood induced glaucoma like hyphema and ghost cell glaucoma, uveitis, retained lens particles, corticosteroids. Retained OVDs usually block the trabecular measure and hence reduce the aqueous outflow. The IOP peaks in around 4 to 72 hours post-operatively. Usually it returns to normal within 24 to 72 hours with intervention. Closed angle glaucomas include exacerbation of pre-existing angle closure glaucoma, pupillary block glaucoma, malignant glaucoma. Post-operative primary open angle glaucoma may be secondary to any anatomic alteration or natural history of the disease. Tight sutures and edema usually alter the filtration angle, hence leading to glaucoma. Early post-operative rise in IOP can be due to retained OVDs or lens matter, post-operative bleeding, post-operative inflammation or pigment dispersion. The treatment is topical beta blockers or brimonidine with or without systemic acetazolamide. Post-operative hyphema, blood may find its way into the AC due to the scleral cataract incision from the iridectomy or any tears in the pupillary sphincter. We can see circulating or layered RBCs in the AC which may or may not cause reduced visual acuity. 
larger the hyphema higher will be the iop in post of hyphema post of hyphema usually causes glaucoma but usually it is self limited and resolves without complications you can see here hyphema at first post of first week post of visit at 3 weeks the hyphema has reduced and at week 4 and week 7 there is no atrophy or pigment loss and there are no signs of inflammation hyphema can lead to either open angle glaucoma due to obstruction of the trabecular meshwork or angle closure glaucoma due to formation of synechiae the medical management is given if there is acutely elevated iop over 40 mm hg or there is persistently elevated iop above 30 mm hg for 2 weeks we give topical steroids and agms and cycloplegics we prefer topical beta blockers and topical or oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and hyperosmotic agents pg analogs and myotics and adrenergic agents are to be avoided in cases of high fever the surgical management is ac wash the indications for surgical management include iop which is more than 50 mm hg for 5 days or iop more than 35 mm hg for more than 7 days the target iop in such cases is to bring it down to less than 25 mm hg ac wash is also indicated when there is corneal blood staining and there is a large clot in situ for more than 10 days or there is total hyphema hyphema for more than 5 days here we can see a bit of clotted blood and on gonioscopy this is how it will appear uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome or the ugf syndrome one thing you left out is backrest bedrest no proper position and bedrest is very necessary ugf syndrome it is due to the iol rubbing against iris iridocorneal angle and ciliary body it is most commonly found in iris fixated and ac iols it is due to the imperfect implant or improper size or position of the lens uveitis is due to the breakdown of blood aqueous barrier hyphema is due to damage by the iol to intraocular pressure elevation is due to pigment dispersion uveitis hyphema and direct injury to the aqueous drainage system Symptoms include blurred vision, ocular pain, erythropsia that is object stake on a reddish hue or photophobia. In signs you can see a poorly positioned iol optic or a haptic which is contacting the uveal tissue. Hyphema cells and flare, transillumination iris defects, synechiae, pseudo phacodonesis and pigments on the endothelium. Gonioscopy may demonstrate blood within the inferior angle, signs of mechanical erosion. poorly positioned haptics or increased pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork ocular hypertension is often present and optic disc cupping and glaucomatous vision loss may may be seen in advanced cases here in this image we can see acl haptic is rubbing against the iris and there is inferior hyphema in this ultrasound biomicroscopy we can see that the nasal optic of an iol is seen abutting the posterior iris surface in a patient with ugf syndrome In this transillumination photo, we can see that there are multiple radial transillumination defects of the iris, as well as circumferential defects, which match the shape of the iol haptics. Treatment include iol exchange for uveitis. We give topical corticosteroids for glaucoma, prostaglandin analogs, beta blockers, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Usually, we try and avoid pilocarpin and other cholinergics. to prevent further chafing of the iris hyphema is treated like i mentioned before in the previous slides coming to capsular back distension syndrome or capsular block syndrome in this photo in the right eye we can see that there is a bulging behind the lens in this there is none in the asoct we can see that there is hyper reflectivity behind the iol in this side there is none it is usually seen in patients with a pcol in the bag after ccc it is seen in immediate post operative period if the ccc is very small that is less than 5 mm and ovds were used during the surgery the ovds prevent the ovds get prevent prevented from passing between the iol optic and the anterior capsule clinical features of the capsular block syndrome include an anteriorly displaced optic iris diaphragm which causes an unexpected myopic overrefraction a shallow ac 
there is increased space between the optic and posterior capsule which can have turbid fluid or retrolenticular pseudohypopion there is adherence of the anterior capsule to the IOL there is early post operative rise in IOP and if untreated it leads to glaucoma posterior synechia and posterior capsular opacification in this chamfer photograph we can see that there is a distended and fluid filled capsular bag behind the posterior surface of IL optic. The treatment includes NDAG laser posterior capsulotomy with steroids or NSAIDs to cover for the possibility of an inflammatory reaction related to the intracapsular fluid release. In some cases, we can do NDAG anterior capsulotomy. Coming to pupillary block glaucoma. That can be late capsular tension also. Late post of capsular tension and the fluid can also be clear, it need not be turbid. What the patient will complain after the capsulotomy? Sir, any floaters? Yeah, patient may complain of floaters or uh, haze, vitreous haze. Sometimes uh, post capsulotomy vision can little drop uh, pre capsulotomy compared to pre capsulotomy because this uh, whatever milky fluid and the lens proteins are there that will get diffused into the vitreous cavity. What will be the patient's complaint? Uh, what does the patient yeah. come to you for when they have a capsular distension? What is the patient's complaint to you? Period post op, probably when in the post operative visit you may see it, but usually many of them are late post op. So the complaint will be? The defective vision. Be a little more specific. Um, uh, Ma'am, everything is minified. His near vision will improve, his distance will come down, right? Yes, yes. ma'am. Well, make it simple. If it's minified now, you are taking it. How do you okay. know it is a macular pathology? Pupillary block glaucoma. It is the most common form of angle closure glaucoma after cataract surgery. In this, the pupillary space or aridectomy is occluded by vitreous blood, inflammatory debris, IOL or lens matter. It includes a deep central anterior chamber with a flat or shallow peripheral AC with iris bombay. On gonioscopy, the angles are occluded. Treatment includes a YAG peripheral iridotomy, pupillary dilatation, which relieves the pupillary block and breaks the synechia, and anti-glaucoma medications. In this lit lamp image, we can see that there is a thin fi inflammatory fibrin membrane obstructing the pupil. The PCIOL is in position and there is a shallow anterior chamber. In this UBM, we can see that there is shallowing of the anterior chamber and post PCIOL is in the bag. Here we can see a fibrinous membrane. UBM, this is the image of UBM done after YAC peripheral iridotomy. We can see that there is deepening of the anterior chamber and the fibrinous membrane is still attached at the pupil. Malignant glaucoma. Also. You do PI at the Bombay, not at Necessarily at the periphery. So, PA at the bomb base. Here is bomb. Your capsular distension also would have produced a shallow AC, no? So, how would you differentiate that from this with the slit lamp? I don't want investigations. And between the posterior capsule and the IOL. Yes. So, I you will find the IOL also has moved forward, and there is a big gap between the posterior IOL, I mean, IOL and the posterior capsule. And your malignant glaucoma, that is also going to be shallow AC, myopic shift, IOL uh, moved forward. Lens AC is shallow, but the posterior capsule also will be forward. forward. All three look very similar. All three can be associated with raised IOP. So they are not going to come proclaiming their malignant glaucoma or pupillary block or whatever. Always see through the tiny pupil, see the IL, see the PC, and see the iris and the gap between the three. That is the diagnostic way to know. All these are just supplementary, your investigations. Okay, carry on. Malignant glaucoma is also known as aqueous misdirection syndrome in which aqueous gets misdirected into the vitreous cavity due to contact of ciliary body with the lens or anterior hyaloid phase. The anterior hyaloid phase acts as a one-way valve and hence there is forward movement of the vitreous which is due to the buildup of aqueous posterior to it. In this classically there is a shallow uh, anterior chamber centrally as well as peripherally but with a patent peripheral iridotomy. Malignant glaucoma maximum risk is in patients with a history of prior angle closure glaucoma. Treatment includes atropine, which pulls the iris lens diaphragm backwards and stops further posterior flow of the aqueous and anti-glaucoma medications. 
in this UBM before NDAG highlight automy, we can see that there is shallowing of the anterior chamber and forward displacement of the iris lens diaphragm and the ciliary body. In the UBM after hyalidotomy, we can see that the anterior chamber is deep and posterior chamber is prominent and the eye will also has shifted back. Post-operative shallow AC can either be early or late. In early post-operative period, if we encounter a shallow AC, we have to check for the IOP and also the CDLs test. If in cases of high IOP and the CDLs is negative, we have to suspect pupillary block glaucoma, malignant, glau malignant glaucoma and choroidal hemorrhage. Shallow ACs in early post-operative period, if the low IOP is low and CDLs is negative, we suspect choroidal detachment and ciliary body shutdown. If the CDLs is positive, there is a wound leak. If there is a shallow AC in late post-operative period, we have to check the IOP, CDLs test, slit lamp examination and fundus examination and we suspect cyclodialysis cleft, retinal detachment and an inadvertent filtering black formation. Those were the IOP changes after cataract surgery. Coming to IOL related complications, IOL related complications include IOL decentration, dislocation, pupillary capture, posterior capsular opacification, anterior capsular phimosis, fibrosis, IOL glare and dysphotopsia. This is a photo which shows extracapsular out of the bag dislocation. This photo shows intracapsular that is in the bag dislocation. The incidence of IOL dislocation is around 0.2 to 1.7%. Most common causes include pseudo exfoliation, prior vitreo retina surgery, and trauma. Risk factors for in the back dislocation include pseudo exfoliation, retinitis pigmentosa, a history of vitrectomy, trauma, zonular dehiscence, and high myopia. Risk factors for out of the back dislocation include sulcus placement of an inadequately sized IOL, posterior capsular rent, a mature cataract, surgical complications. A decentered or oversized, a decentered or oversized rexis, localized zonular or capsular defects, and IOL or haptic damage. Clinical features of IOL dislocation and decentration include unwanted glares, reflections, and multiple images. If the edge of the lens is within pupillary space, it can also lead to pupillary capture and UGH. In minor cases, we can give myotics to constrict the pupil over the IOL optic, or we can give cycloplegics. To reduce iris chafing by IL optic or haptic in cases where we have pigment dispersion or recurrent hyphema. We can also do a laser pupilloplasty to realign the pupillary aperture with IL optic center. In severe cases, we can perform an IL repositioning and stabilization with sutures or an IL exchange. Pupillary capture can be caused due to synechia between iris and posterior capsule due to improper placement of the IL haptics and the shallowing of the AC. The risk can be reduced if a posteriorly angulated PCI oil is placed in capsular black and anterior CCC is smaller than the lens optic. Clinical features include glare, photophobia, chronic uveitis, unintended myopia, monocular diplopia and in such cases it usually requires surgical repositioning of the lens. In cases of acute pupillary capture, we can do pharmacological manipulation of the pupil with patient in supine position. Surgical intervention may be required in order to free the iris, lyse the synechia, manage capsular contraction, and reposition the lens. Anterior and capsular... My favorite uh, ma'am's question is, optic capture can also occur when there is a flabby iris. So because of your frequent manipulation of the iris becomes very flabby, so that also can cause uh, optic uh, pupillary capture. Anterior capsular phimosis and fibrosis Fibrosis is the clouding of anterior capsule and phimosis is the post-operative contraction of anterior capsule opening due to circumferential fibrosis. Phimosis is usually more symptomatic and can cause stress on zonules and decentration of the IOL. Most commonly, it is associated with a small CCC, pseudo-exfoliation and trauma. As we can see in these images, this is a case of anterior capsular phimosis. The treatment is radial NDAG anterior capsulotomy it releases the annular contraction and reduces the traction on zonules. Refractive surprise after cataract surgery can be due to many preoperative causes like ocular surface problems, incorrect biometry, and incorrect for application of IL formulae, intraoperative causes like faulty surgical technique, zonular instability, and lens position. 
post operative causes like faulty refraction technique and healing patterns the treatment of refractive surprise includes spectacles contact lenses laser vision correction piggyback aisles and aisle exchange aisle glare and where is a, where is a wrong aisle power wrong aisle power and uh, biometry and aisle formula okay no that is free of but when you write the aisle power wrongly and the brother has placed the wrong aisle and without checking it that's why we always ask you to check the aisle before implanting aisle glare and dysphotopsia glare is the aisle glare is seen in cases where the aisle optic diameter is smaller than the diameter of scotopic pupil there is a higher risk of glare in case in cases where we use an aisle with a square edge design multifocal aisles and spherical aisles instead of aspheric aisles positive dysphotopsia includes glares flashes and halos of light in the mid periphery negative dysphotopsia include an arcuate or a crescent shaped dark region in the temporal visual field which is due to a well centered pcl in capsule and with an anterior capsular edge overlapping the lens optic as we can see here this is negative dysphotopsia a shadow arc and a shadow crescent coming to posterior capsular opacification it is also known as secondary cataract or after cataract the incidence ranges between 5 to 50% in young patients it is almost 100% within 2 years the risk factors include diabetes uveitis retinitis pigmentosa and a traumatic cataract there are three types fibrous type pearl type and a mixed type fibrous type of pco is from the lens epithelial cells lining the anterior capsule it is seen as wrinkling on posterior capsule at the site of fusion of anterior and posterior capsules pearl type of proliferative type of pco is from the lecs which line the preequatorial zone they are seen as clusters of swollen opacified and differentiated lens epithelial cells also known as bladder cells or weddell cells and the third type is mixed clinical features of posterior capsular opacification include decreased vision blurring of the vision glare light sensitivity impaired contrast sensitivity halos and difficulty in reading here in this image we can see extensive anterior capsular opacification in this image we can see a mixed type of pco with the arrows pointing towards the fibrous pco and these asterisks mark the pearl type area in this image we can see fibrous type of pco in this image we can see proliferative of the pearl type of posterior capsular opacification in here we can see a linear posterior capsular opacity pco can be graded in different ways grade 0 is no pco in grade 1 the pco is restricted to a few quadrants and is not crossing the ccc margin in grade 2 it's almost in all quadrants but it is still not crossing the margin of ccc in grade 3 the pco has crossed the ccc margin and in grade 4 it has also included the visual axis this is the e pco grading of pco in grade 1 there is minimal wrinkling of capsule with a fine layer of lens epithelial cells in grade 2 we have mild honeycomb pco and a thicker layer of lecs with dense fibrosis in grade 3 pco we have classic elchnik pearls and a very thick layer of lens epithelial cells In grade four, we have severe opacity with a darkening effect. Summering's ring. In both these photos show a summering ring. In this photo, we can see the summering ring and stretched zonules. In this, we can see the summering ring and also capsular phimosis. Summering's ring is due to the retained equatorial lens epithelial cells, which continue to proliferate and form new cortical fibers, which eventually. form a ring of cortical fibers between the posterior capsule and the edges of the anterior capsule remnant factors which reduce the chances of pco include a capsular excess diameter which is slightly smaller than the aisle optic so remember summering summering rings are not a type of pco we yes, got it yes sir summering ring is what is summering ring sir it is the uh, proliferation of the Retained cortical matter between the no, anterior no, and posterior. Is it a type of? Is it a type of PCO? No, sir. No. Sir. Always remember, it is a precursor of PCO. Okay, that word should come. Okay, Summering ring is not a type of PCO, but it is a precursor of PCO. The picture which you have taken is not an ideal picture of summering ring, and I mean it doesn't look this. Uh, I mean, so when you see clinically, it has a, a capsule flap superiorly than cortex in between. And the and the shape is donut shaped. 
the typical shape of a soaring ring is donut shape when you take a cross section uh, what is written in the standard books okay but it, it doesn't look like this clinically what i can maybe i mean the picture which you have taken is उंड एज loop haptics instead of plate haptics haptic angulation which pushes the iol back on the pc hydrophobic lenses have lesser chances of pco than hydrophilic silicone and acrylic have the lowest risk pmma has intermediate risk and hydrogel has the maximum risk treatment includes endiac capsulotomy indications are reduced visual acuity glare monocular diplopia anterior capsular phimosis or capsular block absolute contraindications include corneal scars irregularities and edema which prevent us from getting a clear view of the posterior capsule inadequate stability of the eye and an uncooperative patient complications include iop elevation cme rd iol damage endophthalmitis and iritis uh, the iols themselves might undergo some changes this is the photo which shows an hydrophobic acrylic lens with glistening over it this photo shows a hydropho- hydrophilic acrylic lens with calcifications this is a photo of a pmma lens having snowflake degeneration and this is a photo of silicone lens having brown opacification those were the iol related complications after cataract surgery coming to posterior segment complications may i continue sir yeah thank you posterior segment complications include cystoid macular edema photic injury regmatogenous rd and acceleration of diabetic macular edema and epiretinal membrane cystoid macular edema after cataract surgery is also known as irving gas syndrome the peak incidence is usually after 6 to 10 weeks after the surgery it spontaneously resolves in 95% of uncomplicated cases within 3 to 12 months the incidence of angiographic cme after icce is 50% after ecc it is in 20% of the cases and after phaco is in 19% of the cases clinically evident cme can be seen in 1.5 to 2.3% of the cases surgical factors which contribute to cme include a posterior capsular rent vitreous prolapse vitreous incarceration in the wound repeated iris prolapse iris incarceration in the wound retained lens fragments improper iol position and transient or prolonged hypotony Clinical features include multiple cysts in the fovea, peripheral splinter hemorrhages, macular thickening, disc edema, and rarely vitreous cells. Treatment includes topical corticosteroids and NSAIDs. These are my references. Thank you. Pranav, in one of all your slides, you have written uh, against the wound astigmatism. Is it against the wound or against the rule astigmatism? Sir, it's against the wound, sir. Pranav, I mean, is it given somewhere like this? Yes, sir. In Steiner, it is being given like that. Tenet cataract. Yes, sir. Okay, maybe I'm not sure because again the wound I've never heard. Anyway. Same here. Same here. Any questions, ma? Yeah, he has covered it quite extensively. Uh, the and and the thing what I wanted to tell was it also is the barrier for vascularization. So whatever decimals is there, you need to attach it back uh, so that even if you need a future PK, the survival of the PK is better because. that is the barrier for deep vascularization from occurring and from epithelial down growth and N- nice images uh, pranav and it was self explanatory uh, somebody going through your presentation can understand how it happened so it was each one was very well uh, uh, explained so nice presentation yes yeah, sir each topic is a class actually so so it was very nice All the pictures are from SN only. Uh, unfortunately, ma'am, no, I could not get so oh. many photos. Okay. Yeah, it's a nice uh, presentation, but now just only one uh, tip I want to give you. Uh, you can uh, write little less number of words in the slide, and you can put it more in the discussion. Or uh, like no, uh, you can uh, keep a note with you uh, to tell it separately so that. 
your uh, slides doesn't look crowded with the word so maybe you can write it in a pointer or uh, i'm just telling you for the future uh, presentation so sometimes no we keep writing the uh, lines and everything because everything has to be covered but you can make it little less crowded putting less number of words in the slide and make it more uh, thing in discussion so that way it looks neat and clean and uh, then uh, no people will listen to you what you are talking because that's not there in the slide and you are you know interacting with the this thing so just one thing i wanted to otherwise very nicely well covered class thanks a lot thanks sir. okay sir and your tone can be little enthusiastic yes ma'am always nice okay nice short presentation pronounced sensibly covered <laughs>